Dream Seeds Part 15. We are going to continue from where we left off last Saturday morning. Just a small reminder, we went to 1 Samuel chapter 17 and we looked at the life of David. I made a statement last week and I'm going to repeat it again this week. Great achievers usually have learned to replay the memories of their past triumphs and pre-play the pictures of their desired successes. I'm repeating. Great achievers usually have learned to replay the memories of their past triumphs and pre-play the pictures of their desired successes. I shared with you about how important it is for us to know that there are two major functions for a man's mind. I shared with you about how the mind is divided into two things, memory and imagination. And we have already seen how important it is for us to know what the memory does. The memory photographs, files and replays pictures of your past. That's what memories do. Whereas the imagination on the other hand creates or pre-plays pictures of things you want to see happen in your future. Now this is not something peculiar only to that one portion of scripture in, in 1 Samuel chapter 17. But you will also read about it in Psalm 103 where the psalmist talks to his mind. He says, bless the Lord, O my soul and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And forget not all his benefits. In other words, he is telling his soul or the mind realm. Memory, don't forget the benefits of the Lord. Don't forget the good of the Lord. And in 1 Samuel chapter 17, we see one of the most profound examples for this in the life of David. In verse 34, we see him using his memory. He's reminding himself of past victory. Mark it down in your Bible. Write it down please. If you have not done it last week. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. He is not majoring on the times he was lonely. He is not talking about the times when he was looking after his father's sheep all alone. He is not talking about the fears that would have tried to get a grip on him. Instead he is focusing on the victories that God gave him in the past. That's what he is using his memory to do. And then we have seen already, he says, And I went out after him and I smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. That's memory. Now imagination. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of the market down there, right close to that. Memory, imagination. Seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. Then a little later we went and saw how David talks to the Philistine in verse 45. You come to me with a sword and a spear and with a shield. That means natural weapons. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord. We sang about it. Mountain, you've got to move. I speak right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. The name of the Lord. Spiritual weapon of host, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand. Imagination. And I will smite you. Imagination. And take thine head from thee. Imagination. David didn't even, he didn't even possess a sword. He didn't have a sword. But he is imagining the head of that man off from his body. All that he is seeing is a dead carcass lying before him. Why? Because in David's mind's eye, he is already a dead man. The Bible says in Romans chapter 4 that God calls into being the things that be not as though they are. Hallelujah. Let's read that place. Romans please, chapter 4. This is what the God kind of faith does in a man when it operates. You don't see it. But you call it as good as done. Romans chapter 4, verse 17. As it is written, 
There again, the written word of God is important. Sometimes people want to know why we keep talking about the word, the word, the word. It's there in the scriptures as it is written. I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed. Even God who quickeneth the dead or who makes alive the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Hallelujah. As though they were. That's how God does. That's how he operates. I always love to repeat what I heard years, years ago when I was a young baby Christian about how in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, the Bible says, And God said, Let there be light. Brother Copeland was speaking about it. He said, Even when you look at it in English, Let there be light. It means there was a point of time after which light started. But that's not how it is in the original Hebrew. He said the moment God said, let there be light, light was. Hallelujah. Light was. Because even before I speak this sentence, time is ticking by. But it was not so when God spoke. When God spoke, the moment he spoke, light was. And that's why we need to be very careful about what we speak. When you see a mountain, when you see a hindrance, when you see something against you, standing against you. When you see with your physical eyes something standing against you, don't go by the natural. In the natural, David saw Goliath. But he was looking with spiritual eyes at an uncircumcised Philistine. That means a man who didn't come under covenant. A man who was not protected by the Lord. So in his mind's eye, Goliath was no better than a dead man already. Very amazing. Later you will read in that same chapter, In verse 50, but there was no sword in the hand of David. No sword. But he already said, I'm going to cut your head off. Now he's going to follow it up, follow it through. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. That means, what you say is what you will get in life. If you say right, you will get right. If you speak right, you will get right. In fact, what you see in your mind's eye is what will ultimately happen in your own life. You see good, good will come. And now this morning we are going to continue to see how miracles begin in the soil of our imagination. Now God plants dream seeds within you and within me that are incubated in the room of our imagination. Where do those seeds lie in our imagination? Why? Because I told you the word imagination means imaging. Making an image of something that we want to see happen in our life. Now is this scriptural? Very much. Because it is something that God drops into our heart. It's not something that we are capable of ever seeing achieved in our life or lifetime by ourselves. The other day I was reading a book by... Pastor Paul Yongicho was known today as David Yongicho. In that book, he was making mention about how, number one, he was a Buddhist. Number two, he was in poverty. Number three, he was dying of tuberculosis. Number four, he had a low self-esteem about being a Korean that he never thought he would do anything in life. But today... His church is one of the largest churches in the world. And he was just talking about how there was an image transplant that took place on the inside of him when he came to the word. And when he began to see that it is God who does mighty things in his life. He said, when I started preaching, I wouldn't look at the empty chairs. Instead, I would begin to see people come. I would begin to imagine people come. I would begin to imagine that they were sitting before me. And it's no small wonder that his church, they say, or rather he has said in that book, grows by 10,000 members every month. 60,000 people attend one service at one time. 60,000 people sit in one service at one time. And he said, we don't only give out money, we also give out souls. (laughs) He said, we started two branch churches and we gave the pastors on the first Sunday 5,000 members each to start off with. It sounds very funny to us. It sounds so, you know, hard to understand. But here is something that we are seeing, which is scriptural. God is achieving it through a man in not a very well-developed country. 
but in a place where people were always subjugated as servants and slaves by aliens. The Japanese ruled Korea for many years. They forbade people to speak the Korean language. They tried all their might to, you know, somehow obliterate forever something or someone called a Korean. But they didn't. And today we are seeing that this man is having the largest church in the world. Seven services. One day, on a Sunday, 60,000 people sit in each service. It's wonderful because we are seeing that this is something this will work for anybody. And that's what we are trying to do. We are trying to get that kind of a vision in our heart. We want to reach souls. Fine. How do we do it? We are imagining that we will reach souls and we will see them saved and we will see them be a part of our life and our lifetime's work. Hallelujah. For the glory of God. Now let's read on. Now Abraham, when you look at it in Genesis chapter 13, carried a dream seed planted by God. A picture of countless generations of children. Now let's look at that. Genesis chapter 13. That's why I shared with you that this is something very, very scriptural. In Genesis chapter 13, much before Abraham got Isaac, we see Genesis, in Genesis chapter 13, God speaking to him and giving him an image transplant. I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth. Now he is giving him something to imagine. Mark that down, please. If you, if you will, with all correctness of speech, here's God giving Abraham a visual picture, something he can visualize. Every time he sees the sand of the earth or the dust of the earth, he is not seeing the dust, he is seeing children. God's telling Abraham, Abraham, your seed, thy seed, circle the word thy seed, will be as the dust of the earth. That's the first image. So that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. So here's God giving him a picture. A picture of unnumbered people. Numerous children. They will be as the dust of the earth. Now, there's another scripture where we read in Genesis chapter 26 verse 4. This phrase is echoed a, different, a little differently. Genesis chapter 26 verse 4. Now God speaking to Abraham, And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven. Another visual picture. First is dust of the earth, now stars of heaven. And will give unto thy seed all these countries. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Okay, now this is what Isaac is hearing from God. It is something that God gave to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15 verse 5. But we are seeing how each patriarch carried that visualization in their heart. They carried that picture. They carried that seed. Every generation carried an imagination, a holy imagination of the promise of God. That's why I wanted to mark it down. Now this is Isaac. And he is carrying a picture in his heart. Of what God spoke to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15 verse 5. But there is a continuous progression of that imagination being passed down. Each one is carrying that in their heart. They are not having you know, innumerable children in their lifetime. But they are believing that someday it will happen. Hallelujah. And that's what we are called to do in our lives also. We believe that the gates of hell will never prevail against the marching church hallelujah the church is victorious because jesus has given us the victory praise god for that now when god spoke to abraham and his wife in genesis chapter 18 you will see that sarai his wife laughed i want you to mark that down please genesis chapter 18 verse 11 and 12 now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age. And it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. That means she had well pa you know, passed the age of conceiving. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure my Lord being old also. Now here is Sarah. She is laughing. Why? Because they say when the promise was given, 
She was 65 years old and Abraham was 75 years old. In fact, their faith for a son did not happen overnight. It took them 25 years before they would see God give them a child in their old age. Hallelujah. 25 long years. Faith is not just, you know, you name it, you claim it and then after that you see it come to pass. It is not something so easily, you know, seen in people's lives. That's why people sometimes get frustrated. They think, you know, you just have to name it. And then you claim it. And after that it becomes yours. It doesn't happen that, that way. It is a progression of living the life of Christ. Progression of believing every day. A progression of looking to that imagined, desired seed that God has planted into our spirits. So much so that it fills our everyday thought. That when we see it finally come to pass, we see it come to pass just like a child is born into the natural world. We see it come to pass in the spiritual world and we see it manifesting in our lives. Hallelujah. 25 years. They carried this imagination. They mulled over it. And then the Bible says Isaac was conceived. In fact, the Bible itself acknowledges that the power of our imagination is so strong that it can, accompl it can accomplish anything. Last Sunday evening and the previous Sunday evening, I've been sharing in our Tamil service from the book of Genesis chapter 11. I want you to see something there, just one verse. We all know that is, that is the place where we read about how people attempted to build a tower. A tower that is called Babel, the tower of Babel today. And it is there in Iraq. Now Genesis chapter 11, verse 6, this is God acknowledging and I want you to mark it down. And the Lord said, Genesis 11, 6. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. And they have one language. And this they begin to do. And now, nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. It means once a man imagines, it's very, very hard. For him not to see that thing which he has imagined come to pass. It will come to pass. That is why we have to be careful when we use our imaginations. We have to be very, very careful. We have to use it right. Or else, what was given to be a blessing to the Christian believer will become a curse in our lives. It became a curse to these people. Why? Because they wanted to raise up a tar that would propagate their name. That's why everything that has to do with Babylon speaks of devilry, witchcraft, the occult and self-glorification. Self-glorification. When you see the word Babylon, it means that witchcraft, occult, every unclean thing, self-glorification. Because here's these here are these people, they want to build a tar that will propagate their name, that their name will be big in the earth. The Bible says, God saw that their imagination was bad. He came down. Then he gave us a testimony of the power that lies in a man's imagination. What he has purposed, nobody can stop it. He has imagined it. It will come to pass. So I will have to do only one thing. Divide their tongues. The Bible tells us their tongues were divided. And the moment their tongues were divided, the people went their way. What happened was disunity. Today again the Bible teaches us on the day of Pentecost. When the Holy Ghost came, tongues of fire fell upon each man. And instead of disunity, the Bible says the blessed Holy Ghost has been given to bring unity in the body of Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When we lift up Jesus, when we let the Spirit of God lead us, instead of disunity, now there comes an unity, a purpose. And what has been imagined for all time in the heart of God that the church will be His people called by Him, holy unto the Lord will be seen accomplished before our very eyes. Hallelujah. That's what we will read when you read the book of Ephesians. Ephesians tells us why the Holy Ghost and the gifts, ministry gifts were given so that there will be unity in the body. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, Speaking of it, I shared with you about how when a man imagines, it's like literally conceiving seed. Now let's look, go to the book of James chapter 1. And in James chapter 1 verses 13 to 15, all the James is talking about how a man is enticed and tempted. 
it is very very necessary for us to see that in the place of the imagination of a man when a man is slack in that area and if he imagines wrong sooner or later he is going to see the wrong that he is imagined come to pass come with me to james chapter 1 verse 13 to 15 it's referring to how a man is tempted let no man say when he is tempted i am tempted of god for god cannot be tempted with evil neither tempteth he any man mark that down please he never tempts man he is not tempter there is a difference between testing and temptation testing comes from god you may write it down i'd like you to take it down please testing comes from god it is not given with the intent that a man should fail it is given to strengthen a man you must know it or else we'll begin to suspect god almighty and we think oh he's just waiting for us to fall he's not waiting for us to fall what is he going to get by seeing his own children fall nothing nothing when he tests us the tests of god are geared to build us up in faith hallelujah it is to strengthen our faith how do we know it remember what god spoke through moses in the book of exodus he said do you know the reason why i took you through the wilderness i took you through the wilderness simply to show you that a man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of almighty god hallelujah that's why i took you that's why i led you through the wilderness i could have led you through a different path but i was testing you i was testing you to show you that a man can live by trusting the word of god even in the harshest of conditions that's why i was testing you whereas temptation is different temptation comes from the devil it is specifically geared and focused on making a man fall it is focused on robbing the man of having faith in a good god the temptation is given so that a man will take his eyes off god and put it on the tempter what is the final test or the temptation sorry the final temptation of jesus the final temptation of jesus was when satan looked at jesus and told him fall down and worship me that is the what temptation does temptation in its final stage is to remove the eyes of the christian believer from seeing god and to put it on satan himself that is why temptation is dangerous let's read on neither tempteth he any man but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed it's like a snare then when lust hath conceived mark it down it's like lust becomes pregnant it's talking about a pregnancy only thing it's not a good pregnancy it's a bad pregnancy if you'll read the book fourth dimension by pastor paul yongi cho you will see how he was walking around he said i was like a pregnant lady people would ask me where is the table where is the chair where is the cycle you wanted then he said i am pregnant with it people would mock me and laugh at me but before long the lord provided what i had asked that's what we are seeing here when you are pregnant with good thoughts good thoughts will come to pass in your life if you are pregnant with bad thoughts then the bible warns says lust hath conceived it will conceive it bring it forth sin so the word sin or sin is the child of lust how does sin come sin is the child of lust and sin when it is finished that means when it comes into being bringeth forth death exactly we see this progression in the garden of eden genesis chapter 3 Genesis chapter 3 we see the same thing occurring there. The Bible says Eve looked at the fruit and saw that it was good for the eye, lust. Yes or no? Lusted. She said it is good for the eye. Then lust conceived and it bringeth forth sin. Sometimes people think oh she sinned only after she ate the fruit. I don't think so. she sinned the moment she disbelieved god's word 
What happened after she ate the fruit was death. Death came. Spiritual death. That's why we see them running away and hiding. Hiding from the presence of God. Therefore, please write down the progression of thought so you will know how and why we say it's dangerous to imagine wrong. It happens in every man's life. When a man is tempted, it goes through the same stages. Same stages. That is why we have to be very, very careful about what we see and what we, you know, play with in our mind's eye. So we see how imagination is very similar to a person conceiving seed in the natural when it is harnessed and used properly. And when it is done, you find that imagination can unleash unexpected energy. Now this is something I want to share with you this morning. It can unleash unexpected energy. I'll give you a very down-to-earth example. You go out and you've spent the whole day working. From morning till night you've been working. From morning to night you've been working. Working, working, working hard. And then what happens is, after you have been working hard, you come home. And you enter into your home. And as you enter into your home, you move into the kitchen or the work area. And there you find all the dishes piled up. And as you see the dishes piled up, you know you have to sit and do a scrub job. Maybe you'll have to clean up the dishes. And you feel so tired that you say, no, I'll just put it off for tomorrow. I am tired right now. And then as you're walking, you receive a phone call. You pick up the phone. And on the other end of the line, there's a voice excited. The voice says, Sister or brother, I want you to know that just now, just now, you have won, you know, a ticket or whatever it is to go to some place. They have sent us the ticket, it's here with me. Can you come and get it? Now the same tired man who could not wash the dishes immediately throws everything and rushes out of the house. Immediately. Or somebody says, no, I've received some money. It's in my hand. Can you please come and collect it? Immediately the tired person goes. Why? Because if you look at it very clearly, there has been an image transplant which took place. The first image was an image of work. You're tired. Why should I do it now? Let me put it off for tomorrow. That was the image that you were having in your heart. In a moment of time, now you are seeing yourself the possessor of something good. In a second it happened. I tell you, that very tired man or that very tired woman will immediately leave his or her house and go running to get what he says, what the other man said he can have or what the other lady said you can have. Just because on the inside there was a transplant of an image that took place. Something that happens every time. Especially if somebody tells you, I'm leaving out of station. I'm just going right now, but I want to give, out, give you this money. Can you please come? 10,000 rupees, I just want to give it to you so that you can have a good time. <laughs> Daily, every, any tired man will just jump onto his vehicle and keep running. Just to get what the other person said we can have. Why? Image transplant. There's something very down to earth. Now you can relate it to yourself in your particular context every time. Why? Because this is how the imagination of a man works. If the imagination is poor, you are paralyzed into inactivity. The imagination is nice, unlimited energy is released. That's why a famous man of God one time said it like this. He said, tiredness is more in the mind rather than really in the physical body. Think about it. Tiredness is more in the mind rather than in the physical body. Sometimes we think we are tired. But when there's an image transplant, the tiredness leaves. How? Because you begin to see something else, you know, being projected in your imagination. And when you yield to that, you begin to see there is a blessing at the end of the day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, let's look at scripture, please, about why we need to use our imaginations productively and how Jesus did it in his time. Come with me to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. Now this is a, something we must see because we are 
coming close to the time when we will be celebrating along with the church universal the very death of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Matthew's Gospel chapter 16, please. How did Jesus use his imagination? Sometimes when you say Jesus used his imagination, people think you're blaspheming. Because they've held Jesus in such a high place that they can never see him as 100% man. And as well as he was 100% God, they can't. They always feel he was 100% God and 98% man. Let's read Matthew's Gospel chapter 16, verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Mark that down please. He didn't say I'm going to Jerusalem. He didn't say I'm going to be killed there and stop. He followed through. He said, third day, I will rise again. Mark it down. Imagination. It's not yet come to pass. That's why we are studying the scriptures as the Holy Ghost opens the eyes of our understanding. I have read that place time and again. I have read it so many times. Never seen it. He didn't stop with his death. He followed through with the resurrection. Mark it down, please. That means Jesus always saw beyond the cross. Even in our days, we need to learn to see beyond our problems, beyond the hardships, beyond the things that are lying before us. See beyond it. Because when we see beyond it, we see the glory of the resurrection. Hallelujah. Glory of the resurrection. Glory of receiving a name which is far above every other name. Glory of being seated at the right hand of the Father forevermore. Hallelujah. That's what Jesus was concentrating on. Not on the cross. Not on the cross. If you think he was concentrating on the cross, change your thinking please. Please. Look there. That's why I want to bring your Bible. See it. It says, And be killed and be raised again the third day. He's talking about the resurrection. That's why we see when Peter said, No, you won't be dead. He had to rebuke him. He had to rebuke him. Why? Because here is someone standing in the path of his imagined dream. He had to stop him. He had to stop him from talking. He said, Satan, get thee behind me. Because you don't like the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Look at Peter. Peter is trying to stop him not only from dying, but also from the resurrection. How dangerous it is when people come against your imagination. Then he's not just saying, let it be far from thee, Lord. This shall not be unto thee. That means he's saying, Jesus, I am going to see to it that this dream that you are having, this imagination of being raised up again on the third day, it should not come to pass. That's why the Lord looked at him and said, get thee behind me, Satan. Get thee behind me. Imagination. Let's look at scripture again. Mark this down, please. Next time you hear somebody talk, all the time about the cross and never about the resurrection, stop them. Stop them. Take them to the scripture. Show them the scripture. How many of you will do what I am saying? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thank you. Come, let's go to Luke's gospel. I am going to show you three witnesses. If you don't have three witnesses, don't take it. Luke 9, 51. We already read it last week, but I am going to read it again. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. That means he made a very determined effort, effort on his part to go to Jerusalem. Why? Because he was seeing beyond the cross. If it was only death, then he would not have wanted to go. But when he was looking at beyond death, beyond the separation for the three days and three nights, from the presence of the Father, here is Jesus saying, no, I am going to go. I am going to make an effort. Bible says he set his face to go. Another translation says he made his forehead harder than flint. Like a flint stone he became. That means he was so much concentrating on that, that nothing was there to distract him. Okay? Then, 
Let's read on. And sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. He didn't want to stay with the Samaritans. Mark that down please. Don't ever let something distract you when God has spoken to you. Abraham did it. He paid dearly. His father Terah had to die before Abraham would move into the promised land. Check it out. Genesis. Come with me. Genesis, please. This is how we study scripture and see the parallel truth of the principles of God. Underline there. Genesis chapter 11. We read about how God spoke to Abraham to get out of thy country in verse 12, 1. From thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. This was what God spoke to Abraham. He had spoken to him while he was in the Ur, land of Ur of the Chaldees. But Abraham walked with his father Terah. Okay? He was an obedient son. Too obedient for the good, for his own good. Let me tell you something. Even when you come, when it comes to obedience, God never wants obedience in the natural realm to far exceed obedience to his commands that he has spoken to us. Now if you say amen to what I'm saying. Very soft amen. People are terrified. Listen very carefully. When God has spoken to you something directly, God never wants you to then operate in the natural realm and try to be an obedient child or obedient son or obedient daughter to someone who is trying to distract you from following the purposes of God. Never do it. God's called you. God's spoken to you. Do what he says. Look here. Here God spoke to Abraham while he was in the land of Ur of the Chaldees. But what happened was, these people came to a place called Haran or Charon in verse 31. Genesis 11, 31 and dwelt there. That was not the place where God asked them to dwell. Why? Because Haran was very, very close to Ur of the Chaldees. Very, very close. It was also a place where people worshipped the same gods that Abraham worshipped when he was an idolater in the land of Ur of the Chaldees. Even before he began to worship Yahweh. In fact, they worshipped a moon god called Nana. Nana. That was the moon god that they worshipped. And it was this that God was against. He wanted Abraham to make a complete break. Read, read the tragedy that took place in verse 32. And the days of Terah were 205 years. I believe he would have lived longer. And Terah died in her. Terah had to die because before Abraham would move. Because I'm sure Terah would have been like a patriarch. He would have told Abraham, no, you stay with me. Live with me. Don't go. Don't go. Why should we move further? Let's live close, close by. Okay, God spoke to you. Let's just move a little bit. Stay there. Comfort zone. Terah had to die. Then the Bible says, now the Lord had said unto Abraham. This is what God told Abraham before. He didn't listen. Someone had to die. Now, in verse 4, Genesis 12, he says, So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him. He could have done it first. Always an afterthought in many, many people's lives. When they are in good health, they will never take water baptism. When they are in good health, they will never say yes to Jesus. When they are lying terminally sick, they will think of water baptism. When they can't move from their sick bed, that's the time they will be thinking of going to church regularly. When they were in good health, they will never come to church. Never. No time. Then they'll be wanting all the evangelists to come. All the pastors to come. Everyone to come and stand and you know minister to them. It's a shame. This Abraham could have done earlier. But Abraham was an obedient son. So obedient he stayed in a land where God told him not to stay. Terah had to die. It's a warning. A warning to all of us. Now let's come back to Luke's gospel. Read verse 53. And they did not receive him because his face... Luke... Luke 9.53 Because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. That is how he had set his face. And when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? They are getting angry. But he turned and rebuked them and said, You know not what manner of spirit you are of. 
For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. What is he seeing? He is seeing himself as Savior. <laughs> Hallelujah. Imagination. He is not seeing the, himself as destroyer. He is seeing himself as Savior. Imagination. He is believing a time will come when he is raised from the dead, when he will be able to make people part and parcel of God's own family. Hallelujah. He will have the title Jesus, which means Savior. Yeshua in Hebrew. The same word is found in English, Joshua. The word Joshua means Redeemer, Savior, Deliverer. So he's seeing himself, imagination. That's why he, he had to rebuke them. This is the second time he's rebuking them. He rebuked them. Mark that down, please. Power of imagination. How did Jesus harness it? He had to harness it like he's asking us to do it today. It was not easy for him. He was doing it in his time. So he's saying, no, you can also do it. Hallelujah. Savior. Finally, one verse and we'll close. Hebrews. Hebrews. This is the third witness. I told you I'll give you three witnesses. Hebrews. Chapter 12. Verses 1 and 2. Very, very important verses. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. What is this cloud of witnesses? They are the people who are passed on into glory ahead of us. The dead saints in Christ. Not, not anyone who dies, but the dead saints in Christ. They are like a cloud of witnesses. They are cheering us on. That's the picture and the imagery there. It's like a big arena. And in the arena there are people shouting, shouting. Who are these people? They are the people who have gone before us to be with the Lord. Died and gone on. They are cheering us. It's like we are running a race. And as they see us running, they are saying, you can make it, you can do it. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. That means sin and any weight can keep us from running our best. That's why I wanted to see and mark it down. It can hinder us, weight. And let us run with patience. Circle the word us, run. This is one race in which everyone wins. Hallelujah. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Patience is the hallmark of the Christian believer. But it's not a patience that comes which makes him immobile or makes him sit down in his spiritual life. It is an active patience. This patience is active. It is continually believing that the Lord is good. It is not inactivity. Today people think when you say be patient, it means be inactive. No. This patience is active. That's why I want you to write close to that. Active. Active patience. That's why Paul says, let us, uh, the writer of the book of Hebrews says, let us run with patience. The race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus. Circle the word looking. Imagination. Whom should you be looking to? Jesus. Not sister so and so. Not brother so and so. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Now this is the most important part. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. His eyes were not on the cross. His eyes were on the joy that was set before him. Circle the word joy. Underline that phrase. Who for the joy that was set before him. Jesus was imagining the glory that would be his. He was looking past Calvary. Heaven was often on his mind. The right hand of the Father was often on his mind. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He went through the cross experience. Despising the shame. And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hallelujah. That's where he believed he would be that's where he is today hallelujah today god wants us to have an image transplant and that image transplant is written in ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 come with me to ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 the bible says blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in christ hallelujah that means your concentration, my concentration must be on the heavenly 
blessings that is ours today in Christ and that we are seated with him there. If he is seated at the right hand of the Father, don't be thinking I'm seated here in Christ chapel. He wants you to have an image transplant. He wants you to believe that where he is, there you are also with him. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. You are seated with him. He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Hallelujah. So wonderful to know that God wants us to have the best in life. But that best will only happen when we continually dwell or let our minds dwell on that blessedness that is ours in Christ. Hallelujah. We need to imagine what we have today. We may not see it in the natural as yet, but we need to keep imagining this is how God wants me to be. This is how my life can change. This is how I can be a much better person than what I am right now. Because God has promised that I am growing in Christ. He has blessed me with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I am not just living on this earth and experiencing earthly blessings. I am a man who is called to experience the heavenly also while I live on this earth. Hallelujah. And when we do it, we will see our lives are truly blessed forevermore. Praise God. This concludes Pastor Isaac's message.